Okay, recording now. And I'm going to make my screen big so I can tell if you can see what we're doing here. Luckily, I got a bunch of new pens. The downside to this is you will see things backwards, and so I have to switch the camera to show reverse angle or something like that. I can't remember how to do it. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, video, video, video. Video camera, video settings. Here we go. Original ratio, mirror my video. There we go. Touch up my appearance. Did that help? <laughs> it's a button you can do. I can I can touch up my appearance. Well, that makes me look like I have a suntan. Now I look all washed out again. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, let's do HD as well. See if we can get us higher definition so you can see the board a little better. That, that helps, I think. Um, adjust for low light. Does that help any? I don't think so. I don't think we have low light things. I think it's actually the opposite. That's okay, whatever. Okay. Now I'm going to write some things on the board here, Molly. You tell me if you can read them on your end. Oh, no, I, I can't read that. Yeah, that's not fine. Let's try a different pen. Maybe a different pen will work better. That yeah, that looks, that looks better. It like focuses in and out when I step in and out. But okay, we will also, I think I'll maybe try to move the camera a little closer and get a little bit better. A little closer to the screen there. I probably should have worn a different shirt so it didn't have such contrast. <laughs> I'm going to tip this thing over. All right, so we've got, we've got some screen here to work with. The most move my poster of the Higgs boson out of the way so we have a little more screen to work with. All right. So we are working on this whiteboard today. Um, so the homework. How is everybody doing on the homework? Anybody have any questions on the homework? I actually don't know. I guess I looked it over here. Uh, let's see. Homework, physics. Uh, let's see, I can't tell what I'm doing here. Did I share my screen or anything? I don't think I did. No, I didn't. So you're just seeing me, right, Molly? Yeah, that's all I see. Okay. Yeah. Take a look at see what we got going for. What chapter did we just do? Chapter five. So it looks like a couple of people have started chapter five. I'm just giving it a little bit of a look. And that's fine. Looks like maybe somebody asked a question. Another person asking for recording. Okay. So uh, no questions on the homework. Are they, so does, does anybody have any questions? One last time, last, last call for questions on the homework. Any particular problem anybody wants to try, we can we can look at it. I don't remember what's in this. I think it's mostly friction. Chapter five. Uh, yeah, net force, force of friction. I feel like there's an object encounters some friction, acceleration of the object. You can do emotional okay. 
drag force. They do do some drag. There are some questions in here. I just, I want to warn you right away that there are some questions in here that are trick questions concerning the uh, static force of friction. So if you remember um, when we were talking yesterday about friction, the static friction is a variable friction. Now the friction from static movement, where it's, where it's not moving, right? static, static force is going to be less than or equal to the new static times the normal force. Um, so it's it has a maximum it can reach. The maximum of static force is when it's equal to new static times the normal force. But all other times it's less than that. Why why could it be why can it be such a variable force? Because remember the frictional force is going to um, counteract any kind of pushing force. And if it's static friction force, if this is a friction, if this is a static friction, then uh, what it's going to do is it's going to match the pushing force, which we'll call P. Uh, it's going to match it up until this maximum amount that it can that it can apply. And once you get to this amount, it will start to slide and then you switch over to, to uh, kinetic friction, right? But um, the, the reason that this is a trick question is because they'll come along and they'll say, well, one of the questions says something like this, where you have, uh, they tell you what mu is, they say that the, the, the coefficient of static, the static coefficient of friction between two objects is whatever number, point, you know, one nine or something, whatever they, whatever they tell you. And then they say this person, and then they tell you the weight of the box, they say the weight of the box is you know 500 newtons or something like that, and on a horizontal surface, the weight of the box of course pulls down, and then the normal force comes, the normal force points up and counteracts that force. It's the it's um, the force that prevents the weight from pulling the box through the gradient, right? So uh, in this case, since the box isn't going to accelerate in that direction, we know that the weight is equal to the negative of the normal force, right? And so they tell us the weight, and so that gives us an idea of the magnitude of the normal force. So essentially we know this and we know this, um, so we can calculate the maximum frictional force. But then if we do that, if we point, if we multiply 0.19 times 500 newtons, for example, we get something like uh, 100 or something like 98 or something. So, it's, so this ends up being the force max ends up being 95 newtons, total maximum static frictional force. And then they tell us, well, we're going to push with 40 newtons of force. What is the acceleration? Right? So what's the answer? What? No, they, we, we're pushing with 40 newtons. We're going to push this box with 40 newtons of force. What's the acceleration of the box? What did we just calculate? Right here. The maximum static force. What's the maximum static force? Static friction force, 95 newtons. If we push with 40 newtons, what's going to happen? What will the friction do if we push with 40 newtons? It will push back with 40 because it can push with as much as 95. No problem. So what's going to be the acceleration of the box? Zero. Zero. Right? And that's why it's a trick question because we're not always connecting this idea that the static friction is variable up into a point, right? We don't always make that connection. The static friction can, can push and push and push until it gets to 95 newtons. So it can push back against whatever we push with up until 95 newtons. After 95 newtons, it can't it can provide that uh, enough force to stop it from moving. 
and then we just forget the, the static friction and we move to kinetic friction as the box starts to move. Yeah, it's easy to do, and it's it's easy to do not only just talking about it, but in the concepts, because they behave very differently. The static the static friction has this strange thing going on, where it will push back and push back and push back until you push hard enough that it can't push back enough to to stop you from moving. Then the static friction doesn't do anything anymore after that. It's all kinetic. Air. So. Uh, there are, there are a couple of problems like that that throw people for a loop and they end up doing all kinds of calculations and spending all kinds of time. And really they just need to figure out what the maximum friction force was and compare it with this one, right? And then see if this, one, if this one's bigger then you have to do some more calculations. But if the pushing force is smaller than the maximum static friction, that problem's easy. You just say zero, right? You don't have to do any more calculations after you've calculated that maximum. Sometimes they just tell you the maximum static friction is this. And then they tell you a bunch of other things that you can calculate stuff with, but you don't actually have to use it. Right? Physicists love trick questions. It's our way of being cruel to the world because the world was cruel to us when we were students. So we're getting back at it. <laughs> we want everyone to share our pain. Ah. Actually, the reason physicists uh, use trick questions. It's not that we, we do it on purpose, actually. It's, it's just that nature is just kind of tricky. So we think that we understand things, but physics tells us and teaches us that we don't. There was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, controversy over this, and there still is, actually, in the physics teaching world, because this is the way that physics has been taught for many, many years, where we try to break people's preconceptions and break people's uh, their perceived intuitions of, of the nature nature around them by presenting with these things. And, and uh, there are a lot of people that think, well, if you just present these contradictions to, to kids, they're never gonna understand that they got it wrong. They're just going to get frustrated and then, then you're not teaching them all this stuff. As, I've, as I have observed it over the years, I, I think that comes from this culture of you can't, you can't say no to a child and you can't make a child upset and, and pain is bad. And, and, you know, anything, this, this, like this culture of let's coddle everybody and make everything happy for everybody, which I think has created more problems than has ever been in the human race. Um, I actually, I actually really think it's important to feel pain while you're learning. I think pain is the best way to learn, honestly. You know, not many people who have touched a red hot poker ever touch one again. You know, that's an extreme example, but it's a very true one, right? And pain in mathematics is very similar. Pain in physics is very similar because when you spend a lot of time doing something wrong and then you have to start over again, you start to realize, hey, maybe I don't want to do that again. And you, you look for the things you did wrong. And uh, it's not the only way to learn, and it's not the only way to teach, but I think it has a uh, definite value to it. Um, but I think it's also important to, to fess up to students that we're doing. They want, I think it's important that they know it's coming so they can look for it. So that's why I told them. Yeah. All right, any questions from the, Peanut gallery. Well, we do. Does anybody have any questions from previous chapters that they'd like to ask about for the for the test next week? As you're starting to get ready, anything from previous homeworks or anything else? I hate to make you guys come out here or connect, and we don't really do much. Maybe I'll pick a problem and we'll do it together just randomly. Let me see if I can find one that's interesting here.
Okay, so, well, this one, I, I'd like to do this one, but I can't really show the picture on it very easily. Um, they have this one uh, on number eight, where Al is skydiving, right? Where they show all these different uh, free body diagrams of Al skydiving. And you, the job there is to add the vectors together to, great, to, to find a total force or a net force. So when he first jumps out of the plane, the only force is gravity, a thousand newtons straight down, that's the net force then, right? And so net force equals mass times acceleration and they tell you the, the weight of Al. So you have to figure out the mass of Al from the weight, divide weight by 9.8 and then calculate the acceleration from force equals mass times acceleration. And that's what you do in this class. In this problem, I won't actually work it out, but I just stopped at that one. Let's go a little later here and let's do something here. That, uh, not that interesting. All right, so here we have, you just ran out of gas and your car is moving to the right and coasting to a stop. Identify the appropriate free body diagram. So let's just draw that free body diagram. We have a car that has run out of gas. It's coasting to a stop. What are the forces acting on this car? Here's our, here's our point car. Let's see if that's visible. Here's the point that represents our car. What forces are acting on the car? So gravity, gravity and weight are the same force. So that would be uh, weight equals m times g. You say friction also, which way will friction be? So we have to know which way the car is going. Let's say that velocity is this way. So that means friction will be this way. And that's kinetic friction because it's moving. Okay, what else? The normal to the weight, right? And that points in the opposite direction of the weight. We're assuming it's on a horizontal surface, right? So when normally when they draw three body diagrams, they put all the arrows going away from the point. So the friction would actually be this way. Okay. Anything else? That's it, right? You might be tempted to want to have a force over here, right? But there is no force because the gas is gone and the engine's not running if the gas is gone. So the engine was the thing pushing the car forward. The only thing pushing on the car is the thing pushing it backwards. Man, that just does not want to focus on the board here. What's it doing? That camera is struggling. No. Yeah. I so. Okay. So anyway, yep, there's your free body diagram. And uh, let's let's actually do a. Let's say the uh, the so the, the friction that's being the most of the friction in this situation is in the bearings of the actual uh, of the actual hub of the wheel. So let's say that those that friction is something like 0.14 or something like this coefficient, kinetic coefficient. 0.14. Uh, and let's say let's let's actually say <laughs> that's really crazy actually. Let's actually say that instead of uh, instead of it rolling to a stop, we'd hit the brakes. That's even better because if you hit the brakes, then the friction is between the, the tires and the road. And we know what that should be. That should be about one. So mu sub k should equal about one. It's a little bit less than one for kinetic friction. I think it's like uh, 
playing data or something. So in the UK is in the point A, so we hit the brakes and the tire are skidding along the ground, right? And let's say that our initial velocity was uh, 20 meters per second, right? And we want to know, and let's say the mass of the car is uh, yeah, good mass for a car is about a thousand kilograms. So that means the weight is a thousand times times nine point eight, which is nine thousand eight hundred newtons for the car, right? And we want what we want to know now is we want to know um, how far is the car going to slide before it comes to a stop? How are we going to do that? We want to know the distance this thing is going to travel before it stops, delta x. Well, in order to know that from what we have here, what we have is we have initial velocity, all right? We know the final velocity because the final velocity is going to be zero meters per second. Uh, and that's all we know as far as kinematics go. We don't know anything else. We need to know the acceleration. So we need to know what the acceleration is so that we can figure out the delta x. There's no equation that's going to give us what we need unless we know the acceleration or if we know the time. But there's no way we're going to figure out how the time that it's going to take either. And that's not going to be simple to do. So we need to find, we, but we can find the acceleration from this stuff because we know that the forces on this car in the direction that we're moving are just one force. There's no other force, just the friction. So if we can figure out what that is, the kinetic friction, then we can set that equal to mass times acceleration and solve for the acceleration. So that's what we want to do. We want to say that force kinetic friction equals mass times acceleration. And the kinetic friction is equal to mu kinetic times the normal force, so that equals mass times acceleration. And we know that the normal force on this horizontal surface that we're going along is going to be equal to the weight of the car. So it's going to need mu k m times g equals mass times acceleration. Turns out that the mass is on both sides of the mass of the car, so it actually cancels out. We don't actually need to know what the mass of the car is. And we can say that the acceleration is actually equal to mu k times g. Mu k times g. You didn't even need to know the mass. So they might even not even tell you the mass of the car. They might just tell you uh, what I just told you, initial velocity. And then it wants to come to a stop in the mu sub k. Well, now we know what this is because mu sub k we know is 0.8. We know that G is 9.8, right? We get a number there. We plug that answer in here, and then we use a kinematic equation. This is 0.8 times 9.8. And then we have this equation here that says velocity final squared equals velocity initial squared plus 2 times the acceleration times delta x. And delta x is what we want to know. And we have everything else. Police officers, highway patrolmen, and sheriffs, deputies, they all have to go to a physics class once every couple of years and learn this stuff. They have to go to, I think it's in Grand Island where they do it. I have a friend that works in the Sheriff's Department. He has to go out there every couple of years and take this physics class where he learns that equation and others that are related to physics to, to uh, traffic accidents. And if one of the things that they do at the traffic accident is they measure the skid marks, right? And then they use this same equation to calculate the initial speed, how fast they were going when they hit their brakes. And then they can assign blame. And the, the, 
this is actually something that really ticked me off a lot. A lot of police officers will come up to a, an accident and either assign blame incorrectly or not assign blame at all because they're incompetent. They either haven't taken the class or they didn't pay attention and didn't and just don't care. And that to me is just really, I have a friend, for example, from my church who uh, was hit, was broadsided in, by somebody speeding through a, a red light, a yellow light, a yellowish red light. Um, so they were speeding as the, the light was turning red and they said, well, I can beat this. It turned red right as they you know, came to the intersection, which technically means they, they ran the red light and they burned through it while she was pulling into it and completely destroyed her car and put her in the hospital for a few weeks. And now she's still recovering and still can barely walk. And they assigned no blame because they were incompetent because they just didn't know what they were doing. Now, if it was me, I would immediately have sued the police department and that police officer per personally and completely. I mean, because what happened is that her insurance company won't pay for it because no blame was assigned. If no blame is assigned, the insurance company will not pay. You know, so the other insurance company of the person who hit them will not pay. Her health insurance company will not pay because there's no blame assigned. The health insurance company does not necessarily have to pay all of your all of your bills in certain if you have certain for example if you have the health care what's called Obamacare but it's called but it's actually technically something else there are provisions in it that that make it not legal I mean that's it's completely ridiculous the legal things that go on if a police officer is incompetent is out of control and unfortunately many police officers are in. They just don't know what they're doing because they don't pay attention when they take this class or they never took it. They're supposed to, if they didn't take it, they're not supposed to, to do anything. They're supposed to call somebody who did it. But some of them are lazy. It's just that. If we paid our police officers more, then maybe we'd get some better police officers out there and they'd maybe do their job. We do have many good police officers. I don't mean to berate police officers, but. This is true in every walk of life. There are many people who are incompetent because they don't learn these kinds of things that are difficult to learn. You know, like physics and math, they say, well, I don't have to learn that. And then they mess things up around them. <sighs> okay, so if, if there are any other questions, I'll ask one more time, any other questions that anybody wants to do? When is the only do? Yeah, we can move the homework to another day. What we guys want to move it to like Sunday or something or Saturday or something? Okay, sure. No problem. All right. Homework is moved. If there are no more questions, going once, going twice. All right, then we are done for today. Uh, did you guys decide if you wanted to get together and study together at all, or still working on that? You guys kind of still working on that? Okay, that's fine. What's that? You can if you want, or you can just tell me after you're done deciding. It doesn't matter one way or the other. All right, uh, enjoy your weekend, and make sure that you contact me if you need any help. Have a great day.